If you turn on the television, you have more choices these days than ever before. And one of the genres of television that you can watch a lot of are legal shows. And for me, who grew up a product of the 70s and the 80s, I watched a show called LA Law. And I relate that to a lot of other shows along the way because even though I've been watching legal shows for 30 years, when I look at the lawyers, they have a few things in common. They're very smart, they're very well dressed, and they spend a lot of time arguing. And if that's what lawyers do, I get it. But I also know for many of the lawyers that I have met, they often, sometime in the course of the legal career, begin to ask themselves questions. Is this it? Is this what I should be doing or is there something else out there? Welcome to A Climb to the Top, Stories of Transformation. I'm Chuck Garcia. With me this evening's guest in the studio today is Carrie Bassel. Carrie, welcome to A Climb to the Top. Thank you, Chuck. When uh, my introduction was purposeful, because when I think about your background, you are a lawyer. Talk about, you are, let me back up, you are a lawyer. You are bilingual, born and bred um, in Montreal, Canada, and yet you came to the United States to, with an intent to practice a career that was subject to change. Walk us through your college and your law school considerations and what you had in mind when you were going through that education. Sure. So, uh, born and raised in, in Montreal, and um, had the fortune of having an incredible school in my backyard. So I attended uh, McGill. You know, for Canadians or particularly Montreal, you don't go to college. You don't leave your house at 17. Um, so, to my parents' dismay, I was in the house till probably about 21. Was um, studied English at McGill, and then at the time, in terms of being a young adult in Montreal and wanting to grow and wanting to participate in something a little bit bigger, you had to leave, unfortunately. Um, the jobs were in the States, the bigger companies were in the States, the bigger law firms were in the States. To practice anywhere internationally was more about moving. My older brothers had already moved to the States, so I, it was just, it seemed a natural path. I don't know where the idea came from, but I just knew I wanted to get here. Um, and so when I went to go apply for law school, uh, once I graduated McGill, um, New York was just the natural, um, natural choice. So I applied to as many schools as possible. I was fortunate to get a scholarship at Cardozo. So at that time, I think our currency rate was, <laughs> was, was uh, pretty tough. So it was, it was great to obviously have that support to come down to law school. And I have to be honest, I just kind of followed the linear path. It was just something I graduated. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I had done a stint, funny enough, at ABC Good Morning America here in New York over the summer with um, the food production, which is where I eventually, you know, ended up a little bit. But um, with with that in mind, I just, I wasn't done learning. I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And so everybody always said I'd be a great lawyer. So I went to law school almost a little bit blind, I have to say. And then in truth, I did actually find myself in law school. It kind of did feel like a natural fit. It was something that I was supposed to do. Um, at that time. At, at that time. At that time. At that time. You joined quite a prestigious law firm. Talk about that experience, and then you ultimately went to in the high, uh, sometime in the financial crisis to AIG. Yeah. Talk about the law firm you joined, and what was it like to be a lawyer in litigation? Sure, sure. So uh, I um, had the fortune of joining Millbank Tweed. Um, right, I joined them as a summer associate back in 2000, and then in 2001, I was offered a position as a full-time associate in the litigation department. Um, in fairness, I think that at the time, um, Millbank was trying to rehabilitate an image as a lot of law firms were, um, with very little women um, being hired um, and having uh, very, very few women partners. Actually, I think there was one um, throughout the entire firm um, when I had joined, um, and that subsequently has changed, and they've done an incredible job. But I was lucky, I think, that I came under a, a change in terms of the appetite for hiring um, women. And so I was able to uh, join this um, incredibly prestigious firm. And um, interestingly enough, my Canadian background, and more importantly, my French, was what ended up really shaping my career. I was fortunate. One of the uh, partners 
did a lot of work with French clients. Um, he's been a Francophile himself, American born, but um, happened to develop a, a big roster of French clients. And my first case was, was helping to uh, translate uh, correspondence as um, my client was trying to actually reacquire art that was taken from her uh, during World War II. Um, so it was a lot of French correspondence back then. And then I ended up working with BNP Paribas, again, a French bank. So here I was not thinking that my French had any, you know, any role in kind of what my career was going to be. And then it happened to have helped a little bit. Here Lesson number the, one, bilingualism is important for career growth, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, I, I, again, you know, I didn't appreciate it growing up. It was something that I had to do right. in order to live in Montreal. It was something that was required, you know, for education. And also if you, you know, wanted to move around the city at all, you had to be bilingual. And I never, and again, I moved to the States thinking that I didn't want to practice in French. I didn't want to really use my French. I didn't feel confident in it because I didn't speak it at home. Right. And then here I was, you know, at a big New York law firm translating documents in, in French. So it's, it's, it's was interesting that it kind of came back to me. And yet you moved on to work for a big insurance company that was caught up in the financial crisis called AIG. Sure. What, what did you do? So, uh, you know, in fairness, when I was trying to make the tra uh, transition, I have to be honest, I found um, it was very, that working at a firm happened to have been physically exhausting. Um, the business model, and this is perhaps to your point of where, you know, things um, and why you see people question it is because the business model is, you know, it's a by the hour business. Um, and a lot of, you know, my friends and colleagues do incredible work, but they work incredibly hard. They have to. Sleeping, socializing, anything is at the cost of them not otherwise being productive. Um, and it's, it's difficult and you have to be exceptionally passionate and dedicated. Um, and so the opportunity to perhaps regain a little bit of balance, I thought, would be to take my skills and go in-house. Um, because again, the, the business model was not by the hour and it was by you know, your efficiency and your content and your contribution. Fortunately, you end up being a cost center for the corporation, which, <laughs> which is other issues. But that being said, at AIG, I actually joined um, post um, Mr. Greenberg's exit, right. um, which was a fascinating time because Litigate, they didn't really have a very large corporate litigation department um, and, and, a, and a robust, you know, kind of pool of attorneys at the corporate level. And I was brought on at that point, um, unfortunately, in the midst of massive shareholder lawsuits, federal and state investigations. And so I was uh, brought on to increase the size of the team and to increase the power to um, defend against that. So it was. And, and was that part of the backlash from the financial crisis? Um, so, I mean, yes. So it was. It, it was. It started. So this was earlier. This was. This was. Pri this was two thousand and. Oh God, seven. I want to say like so. It was a little. Pre it was. It was. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. Um, but what I thought was interesting, though, is that here was, you know, here was front page news litigation, investigations. I mean, we I was right there. I was right in the thick of it. Managing um, the headline risk. Managing the headline risk. Um, also managing, I mean, you know, um, Spitzer, this was this was a whole different genre of, um, of AGs and, uh, you know, of white collar crime, corporate investigations. And it was just, again, it was so cutting edge. It was, it, it has taken me now to kind of look back to realize what kind of storm I was in at, at the time. It just, it, you know, it's... You're going to I work. Just, I was going to work, yeah. you know, and I was doing it, and it sounded exciting. I had the skills to do it. I, you know, I had been, I had experience at Millbank with shareholder lawsuits and, you know, the cutting edge law and staying on top of it, and so I was valuable at the time. And then, you know, it just, it was, it was incredible. I didn't realize what I was actually in until I got out of it. To be quite well, honest. actually, that's an interesting point. Let's talk about this. Something must have happened because I want to talk about where the twist and the turn and your transformation occurred because I don't know if it was a conscious decision, I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore or I'm going to go to something else. What happened in your mindset and what decision did you make when you left AIG? Sure. Truth be told, um, I was miserable. Mm -hmm. um, I was newly married. I wanted to start a family and instead of being physically tired, I was just emotionally tired. I wasn't passionate about was, uh, what I was doing. I was very good at it and I was successful and I loved my colleagues and, you know, we, I loved going to work, but, you know, I came home just to be quite honest, very empty, um, you know, in juxtaposition to, you know, my husband who was, you know, at a different, um, he was in finance and he was on his own climb, but seemed a lot more passionate and a lot more into it. And, 
and seeing that juxtaposition and want, again, wanting to start a family, um, I, having been kind of on this straight and narrow path, I think a lot of people talk about gap years, you know, now I never took the gap year. And so um, I wanted to kind of press pause. Um, it was a, it was something that I was fortunate that again, I was, you know, married, I had had, you know, a successful career. So I was financially at least stable to take that risk. Um, and I just, I really wanted to press pause. But of course, because <laughs> I am who I am, I didn't want to press pause and do nothing. Right. And that's why I enrolled. I had always had a passion. I always wanted to go to culinary school. Yeah. And so I had left AIG in July. I said, okay, maybe I could deserve a little vacation. Yeah. <laughs> but I knew I had, I knew that that kind of fun had to stop. I, w I knew there had to be kind of a, a, a due date of when I had to kind of get back to the real world. And so September, maybe third or six, right after Labor Day, I donned whites, yes chef, no chef, 7 a.m. start. I mean, it was, and it was, the discipline was incredible because, um, again, it was like, chef, can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> chef, I, you know, chef. And so, and all of a sudden, you know, here I was, you know, this this powerhouse lawyer who now was just, you know, thank you, chef, and may I, chef, and again, and you're making balsamic uniform. reductions yeah, exactly. when I'm somebody making, says like, so. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I'm cubing, I remember, like, I mean, our homework, I was taking home, like, sacks of potatoes because you basically had to turn in tournées, which are essentially, if you think about it, like football you know, little footballs of, of potatoes, but while they may seem quite innocent, you can imagine trying to carve that with, you know, with, with a paring knife. I and can barely we, cut a potato in half without screwing well, it up. Well, you know, if you want, I could, <laughs> you know, actually I probably have a little PTSD <laughs> about, about doing it, but, um, but if you want, I'll. Well, this is an interesting part here because here, all your education, mm -hmm. high expectations, high performance value in what you delivered as an attorney you're now in the service of someone who's about to eat a plate of food yes. that you had cooked and prepared. This, to me, is transformative because you didn't stop with the cooking. You went on to do other things, but before we explore it, how did you feel as you were now aligning a sense of passion and purpose? Because cooking for people is purposeful. Maybe being a lawyer is, but somehow I think differently about the culinary consideration of a purpose. So here you were in a kitchen, not using your law skills necessarily. How were you feeling about where this was going to take you and what you do about it? So I have to say it was, um, it was a quiet time for me because it was kind of a look inside because you know a lot of the time, even though you're in a busy and bustling kitchen, you're really by yourself in your own task, um, in, your own in your own head. Um, and sometimes you actually don't see you see that you know you see the results of what you're making, which was actually kind of nice. And I'll say that that was a lot. That was very fulfilling to me. It, unlike where the law was, like sure I contributed to a brief, sure I handed in research, but it was always kind of a part of some bigger picture. Where you know my my potatoes or you know my balsamic reduction or my duck confit or when I deboned a rabbit. I mean unbelievable but I was using my hands kind of for, for the first time really um, and my mind of course and the patients I remember that the best form of therapy was when we moved to our um, when we moved to basically the the baking um, side of our curriculum we had to every morning melt our own chocolate make our own cornets and write our write our names in cursive and chocolate <laughs> 20 times before you could start your day if you've ever written your name in, <laughs> in cursive in melted chocolate, it's it's it takes an incredible amount of di discipline. And I was, can't write it correctly with well, a there, big well, pen. Well, there you go, well, there you go. So, and by the way, neither can I. I've got terrible <laughs> handwriting. Um, so that was incredibly disciplined. And, and you know, the, again, the 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 shift. It was humbling. I have to be honest. It was right. exceptionally humbling. And I and I was surrounded by a lot of talented people that had their high school degree. Because don't forget to go to culinary school. You don't need you don't need a graduate degree. You don't need any. I think you just need actually a certificate. And what was the world telling you about Carrie? You went to Millbank. You went to AIG. You're an attorney for God's sakes. What are you doing? Did you get that? Yeah, I still found in cocktail parties. I was I was putting my hand out and saying I'm an attorney, and right. I used to work in Mil at Millbank. Yeah, no, okay. And I have to say, for a very long time, I still I still did that. I still very much find a way to somehow tell someone that I was an attorney. Um, but it, it's what you did. Is it who you are? No, and and it's and it's and it's interesting. I think I cling to it because it sounds like it's you know the most 
respected or, you know, because I did, look, I, I absolutely worked hard for it. Fair law enough. school was law school was not easy. It was an, an exceptional commitment. Staying up till, you know, all hours of the day writing briefs at Millbank was, you know, exceptionally hard and 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 required a lot of um, of intellect and discipline. But that being said, no, it, it, it never defined me. And I think that's probably why I got out when, when I did. You are tuned in to a climb to the top stories of transformation on 77 WABC radio. I am Chuck Garcia. My guest this evening is Carrie Vassell, and Carrie is talking about a transformation that may be unexpected to many people who follow the linear path, but she's in the midst of something really cool, because after law school, after her many years of litigation, she's now in the kitchen saying, yes, chef, and cooking in the service of other people's happiness. But in the midst of all of that culinary delight, she walks into a studio, jumps onto a bike, <laughs> and starts teaching spinning classes. And before she know it, everybody no uh, east of the Hamptons is walking into her spin class. Something else is happening here. What happened from the cooking experience to the time where you're following the next passion? Sure. I will actually give credit um, to the owner of the studio for that one. And that was somebody kind of tapping me on the shoulder and pulling me kind of up to the front. Um, I was taking classes I had always taken um, indoor cycling as a form of exercise since I started law. Um, even when I was studying uh, at Cardozo, uh, it, there was a studio right near me and it was 45 minutes, it was efficient, so it was great workout. Um, and so I had become a regular at this particular studio and the owner kind of tapped me and said, you know, you should try and teach. And I kind of laughed and then I realized, well, I guess I used to yelling at people and <laughs> I'm used to arguing. You know, I'm used to arguing and you know and and you know I mean I, I guess you know it takes a certain kind of personality to you know to be in litigation and to you know to be a lawyer and and um and I always loved music and you know and again I was a good and solid um client and clearly athletic and you know could clearly um take the classes and and keep up and so she pulled me up to the podium and was just like give it a shot and um I did actually, unfortunately she had, she was sick one day and she needed me to kind of just, she like called, she was like, would you just step in? And the rest was history. Right. I mean, really and truly what I thought was a, you know, was a job turned into five years of, you know, packed classes, celebrities, loyal. I mean, I had clients who would tap me on the street and be like, oh my God, I loved your class. I mean, I, I, it's such a out of body experience to be quite honest when I was, <laughs> it wasn't something totally unexpected. Did you even consider when introducing yourself, I am Carrie and after a spin class, I'm a lawyer. Where was the law in your head? The, the lawyer in you? You know, I have to say that motivating people and navigating a class again of 70 people and taking them on what was a 45 minute journey. I think that where my class and probably what my success was in there is that because of my kind of critical and deep thinking I thought about my classes I didn't just put on you know Madonna and say go you know sweat for 45 minutes you're not taking I actually box. no I actually cared about it and I had the discipline and so you know carry the lawyer I think it was just that I was always thinking I'd be on my toes I would see that all of a sudden I had this great playlist of class classic rock you know and I was so excited to just you know just spin to it and sweat and then literally half my class was easily all 25 year olds you know and then I was like well I don't think Bob Seger is going to resonate here you know so I go and I have to switch up to Kesha and you know Lady Gaga and and rocked it so I think that also so again there was tactical decision it was thinking on my feet that you know perhaps another instructor would have just been like okay I'm just going to press play like I wouldn't know how to maybe be agile that way and think on their toes so yeah carry the lawyer I guess showed up in yeah, but, but you delivered a mindset, and I would think that this is the culinary mindset where you are delivering that plate mm -hmm. with a mindset that somebody is going to benefit from this, and this is your work. Mm -hmm. And here you are in the studio, this is your work. But something happened along the way where you took a pivot. And while I know you got your real estate license, and it's like, was that, was that just, you know, what, why, why not? You know, that was, I wanted to put my suit back on. Right. It was, it was, you know, it was time. I, I had the experience. I had the connections. I had been referring people to real estate. It was just, it was honestly, it was, it was something, it, it was something that again, kind of came in my path. Um, and I took advantage of it. Um, I needed to make <laughs> needed to make money, right. um, and it was something that I thought I could be good at, kind of combining my people skills, my obviously getting back into the negotiation skills, my eye, 
Um, and so it was, um, again, it just seemed like a natural progression. There wasn't really much thought to it. And then now I look back and I've met some incredible people there and it was, it, it was a very purposeful several years. And in retrospect, the twist and turns up of this mountain mm -hmm. for all of the challenges and all of the adversity, you now go to work with a very different dimension, I would say, as toward what you are projecting to the world about Carrie's identity. You have come into a situation, when you described it to me, you had me at hello. I said, oh my goodness. And my partners and I, when we talked about this and I explained to them this concept that had been explained to me, I was, oh, finally, somebody is trying to do this. Explain the circumstances of what you and I talked about in this organization that you are now a partner in. What are you doing? Sure. So I'm currently director of strategic uh, partnerships for Converse Savvy. Converse Savvy is about to launch. We're in our pilot program. Uh, we are a virtual and AI-based technology platform. We customize virtual reality scenarios for soft skills training, um, specifically um, you know, workforce readiness. We are now in the process of creating a job interview scenario. Where this all came from, though, and this is where the my heart is full, and I think I finally arrived, so to speak, is that it actually started from a socially conscious place. Um, a friend and the, our co-founder had developed a workforce readiness program for um, English second language learners. Um, she'd partnered with Riseboro, which is a community service center out in Bushwick, which has a ton of arms in terms of what they do, but one of the things that they do is an English language program um, for immigrants. And throughout her journey, she had actually realized, and through her education, as she's, uh, she's been teaching English to immigrants for, for decades, is that virtual reality as an immersive product is extremely, extremely helpful um, for retention and also in taking away the fear factor in attaining a new language. But what I thought was interesting and where we started to commercialize the product is that fear <laughs> and retention is a huge issue in any type of learning, right? And so, and particularly in conversational training. And so to commercialize it, we have now, we have now started to build and we're in the process of building different scenarios for other kind of corporate soft skills development. So here we are piloting our program with the least proficient speakers, the least proficient communicators, mm -hmm. and we're leveling them up to allow them to have an opportunity to practice job interview skills, answer questions like, tell me about yourself, which thank God you didn't ask me because it's the worst question. <laughs> it's I, I, the worst question. Gary, it's <laughs> I, I don't know whether what I do, I do it well or not. I, I strive every day to, to deliver something exceptional. That is a question I will never ask. <laughs> Thank you. And if anybody asks me, I'll ask them, so what's for lunch today? Yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Keep, keep going with this. Yeah, this is no. important because here it is, the culmination of the many things that you have done. Maybe it was all meant to, leave you, to, to lead you to this place? I mean, it's, it's possible, and I, I'd, I'd like to believe that, you know, as I was sitting here and, and watching, you know, you do your incredible work, I'm looking at the climb to the top, and I had to ask myself, like, What's the top? Because I definitely I don't I don't see it. I don't know where it is. But you know, but it but I have to say, you know, in a way, as you're taking me through this, maybe I am starting to feel like I'm arriving. Um, because the great thing is with the startup is that I have um, I have um, now put a little bit of my lawyer hat back on. Um, you know, we've, we're a small corporation, so all the corporate documents, thinking about patents, thinking about the like. You know, I'm kind of functioning quasi GC right now, asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. But again, through my climb and my twist in terms, the relationships that I've made are helping us in terms of opening doors to sell our product, to, act, to get people like you to help advise us to make our product more robust um, and to make our product effective and hopefully this company you know, successful. Well, it's wonderful work you're doing. I think it's great. In our time that's remaining, Carrie, one mm -hmm. of the things, this is a common thread to our show, we ask ourselves, what do we want our listeners to think? What do we want them to feel? And what do we want them to do? And I'd like you to frame your answers relating to the very smart, well-educated, dressed well, maybe doesn't argue for a living, but to those females out there who are contemplating and, and heaped sometimes, I believe, with unrealistic expectations about what their lives are supposed to be. 
Let's start there. What do you want our listening audience to think about their careers and their climb to the top? I would say for someone who's exceptionally afraid of change, change is good. <laughs> good. Um, and that um, don't be afraid. I think that I think that fear often stops us. I think that we, you know, for me, I could have easily stayed at Melbank and had an incredibly successful career. I loved my colleagues. I was liked by my superiors. I did good work. Same thing at AIG. Um, but I, I wasn't happy, right. you know. And and so I think that the fear and the fear of change um, could have stopped me. And I have to say that. I, if I stayed there, I know that I can look back on myself. I would have been miserable. It just wasn't. It wasn't the right. It wasn't the right fit. Okay, that's a good one because that segues into feel because that's so much more important. As yeah. human beings, we feel first. Yeah. We think second. What do you want them to feel about where they are in time and place, and what can they expect in these twists and turns? Sure. I would say, does it feel right? Um, and and I think that we don't often trust our gut. Um, but I will say is that um, I, I didn't feel right in certain of these positions. And whether it was I had a good support system or more confidence in myself than I realized, I didn't. I listened to that, and I didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't feeling right. And so I would say that listen to your gut and feel your gut. You know, you know if you're you know you're if you're in the right place. And now comes the execution. Okay. What do you want him to do? Let's see how. be true to yourself honestly I want you to do I mean obviously do good and do right but if you're not taking care of yourself you're not gonna be any good to others um, so I think that you know be, be true to you yeah, good yeah. message you have listened to a climb to the top stories of transformation with Chuck Garcia my guest this evening was Carrie Basil Carrie thank you so much for coming into the studio and for sharing your story thank you to all of our listeners good night